Okay, I've started the video. And uh, thanks again, Anders, and turn it over to Chris for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Jones, and I want to welcome you all today's, to today's exciting geospatial forum. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take a moment to welcome our fall 2021 PhD cohort for geospatial analytics. So everyone give them a brief round of applause. So I'd like to welcome you all. So now without further, further ado, today's speaker is Dr. Anders Husef. Anders is an assistant professor in NC State's Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology and a CGA faculty fellow. Much of his time is devoted to insect pest management with responsibilities for faculty or for ugh, with responsibilities for insect pests affecting field crops and sweet potatoes statewide. He focuses on applying geospatial analytic approaches to applied insect ecology, including insect dispersal and movement, population dynamics, and insect insecticide resistance management. And with that, I'll let Anders take it away. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for uh, attending today. I'm really pleased to be here, um, really try to focus in on uh, some of the issues that we're experiencing in North Carolina as far as crop production and how we can apply geospatial analytics or geospatial techniques to better understand uh, how pests move around in the landscape and, and what we can expect and provide growers with recommendations. And so this talk is more of a, a view from the practitioner's perspective of how we might be able to leverage some of the techniques developed in, in the center to better understand how we can address farmer needs and provide these stakeholders with better solutions to understand their, their pest population dynamics. And so I'd like to just start off, uh, hold on, I'm gonna share a different screen here. Sorry, everybody. Kind of having a little bit of a, there we go. So the goal of uh, the talk today is really to sort of address some of these issues that we're having in sweet potato pest management, as well as um, uh, field crops pest management. And I'd really like to give an acknowledgement to my team, first of all. Uh, so our mission as the row crop and sweet potato pest management team is to think about ecological interactions of these insect pests in the environment and really how we can apply fundamental and or both fundamental and applied information through innovative science to be able to link insects to landscapes and landscapes and insects to their management in support of sustainable agriculture. And I think that this is uh, a broader goal of a lot of different policymakers is how can we make uh, agricultural systems more resilient uh, and enable uh, growers to make better decisions without impacting the environment and surrounding rural communities. And so I'd really like to acknowledge my team. Uh, these are the sort of the people that have been shepherding the program through as far as research initi initiatives um, in a variety of different systems. So just for context, because not everyone's familiar with the sort of research and extension system, um, my program is based on uh, both basic uh, translational and applied outcomes uh, as far as research goes. We collaborate on a variety of different issues with folks throughout the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences and also the College of Engineering to come up with innovative solutions. And so on the basic side, we're asking questions about pest dispersal dynamics, movement within uh, agroecosystems, but also how we can uh, disrupt pest biology. And so we're, we're using things like rolled cover crops to inhibit uh, uh, pest dispersal into uh, crops like sorghum, which is one of our grain crops in the state. We're also interested in spatiotemporal risk modeling uh, for resistance in a variety of different systems. That pipeline really feeds into the translational side of my research, thinking about how we can incorporate new technologies like insect pheromones to be able to track population dynamics uh, in sweet potatoes of, of our key wireworm pest. Uh, and then another project I'll talk about a little bit today is real-time moth trap design and how we can enable growers to be able to uh, see data in a better way uh, to make better decisions about how they scout the crop to find uh, injurious levels of the pest. 
And then the applied side. This is really where I plug into the equation. It's communicating with growers about some of the research outcomes that we have generated in various different stakeholders, both in industry, like in RTP, uh, but also uh, the federal government through the USDA, et cetera. So probably the most exciting part of my program is just all the on-farm research we get to do. And I've really valued this from my graduate uh, training all the way through the development of this program, which is in its third year. We do a lot of interactions with growers. And so all of our work uh, focuses in on trying to understand realistic agricultural systems. And, and, and because of that, we do all of our work or the majority of our work on farm. And so here are a couple of different pictures of on farm research that we've been doing in the last several years, looking at moth trapping with pheromones, um, uh, collecting cotton bowls. I'll talk a little bit about that work, working with growers on, you know, how can we optimize scouting for cotton bowl worm? This is the commercial field when they took it to yield with a, with a cotton picker in the far right-hand corner. And then some of these other aspects of the program on minor crops, sweet potatoes, um, also this rolled cover crop. So it's really interesting to get out there and interact with farmers because you can have a good understanding of what their needs and values are, as opposed to guessing from the, from the chair of the researcher. It's good to assess what those needs are so that we can generate research outcomes that have the greatest amount of impact. And so the talk outline for today uh, is really focused in on, you know, just a, a primer, like why, why insects? Why should you care about insects damaging crops? And I think not everyone has the experience uh, of maybe growing a home garden to know how injurious insects can be. Uh, so we're going to touch a little bit about, you know, what makes an insect a pest and what can the consumer expect from the, you know, the products that come into the grocery store and why farmers devote so much effort to protecting those crops. And then I want to talk a little bit about agricultural landscapes and how management plugs into that system. We do know that, you know, the composition and configuration of landscapes is really important for producers uh, as far as their risk for pests and probably in translation, their, or their, their needs for actually applying insecticides to uh, suppress populations. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about a case study focused in on cotton bollworm. Uh, so that's an insect pest that's a noctuid moth. Um, it would come to your light and your back porch uh, generally. Uh, so it would be a fairly nondescript brown moth, uh, but it's a major crop pest throughout the uh, southern US uh, on a variety of different crops, including peanuts, cotton, and corn. Uh, so really, we're going to talk a little bit about geospatial analysis and the, the sort of thought process that we've put into that cotton bollworm problem through the lens of an emerging resistance risk crisis to BT crops, which are genetically engineered corn and cotton. So first, just as a step back, you know, pest diversity and ecology are, are fundamental concepts to think about when we're considering why a pest becomes such a major issue. We experience periodic outbreaks of some insects uh, due to changes in landscapes, changes in host plant diversity, uh, changes in production practices. And some of the important factors are really their life cycle, their ability to disperse, their reproductive potential, certainly, you know, wh whether they have non, uh, natural enemies that are limiting populations. And all of those things factor into what really makes some pests uh, very capable of, of being um, widespread economically damaging insects. And here are a couple examples from the last couple of years that I've looked at. So potato beetles on eggplant, uh, this is probably one of the uh, most important solanaceous pests uh, globally. Uh, certainly, wireworms are a pest of uh, sweet potatoes here in North Carolina, a crop that we grow about 90,000 acres of annually, uh, aphids, white flies. And what I, what I think is important is really to see the diversity in um, uh, morphology, you know, the size, the shape. All these pests are significant issues on crops in the state. Um, but today we're going to focus in on the lower right hand corner, which is uh, bollworm, otherwise known as cotton earworm or tomato fruitworm. Entomologists are notorious for having several common names for the same species, which is Helicoverba zea. And so I'm going to focus in on that for the case study uh, as a representation of an insect that we can learn a little bit more about geospatial analysis with. And certainly, 
the basics of the system are important to understand. So what is insect damage and why should a grower care? So here's a, a depiction of cotton and one of our key insect pests in the northeastern part of the state is uh, tarnished plant bug or Ligus linealaris. And on the very left-hand side, you see the infestation event. So there's a nymph on the cotton bloom that, and you can see that sort of necrotic feeding that insect has been feeding on that flower and that flower will be of reduced viability as far as seed set inside the cotton bowl. Another outcome of Ligus feeding is the reduction in fruiting positions. And so, as you see from this missing square, uh, the plant has excised the square, that's where the bowl will form. And that represents a yield loss for the grower on the plant level. And when we look at this UAS imagery, you can see the variation in lint abundance across that whole uh, treatment structure. And so this is a nice depiction of when insects are not necessarily controlled, what can be the outcome? And this is where growers get very concerned. You know, uh, the reduction in lint yield translates into an economic loss, especially in some of these row crops that have very narrow profit margins. They're concerned about uh, losses of lint and therefore they're more proactively managing the crop in a lot of cases. So from the consumer perspective, um, we oftentimes think of aesthetic injury as being one of the things that, you know, is undesirable. However, you know, injury from insects happens in a variety of different ways. And this motivates growers to make insecticide interventions to uh, reduce losses. And so it can be a quantity issue like we discussed just before. The number of bulls per acre translates into the economic uh, yield. Uh, fewer kernels, here's that corn earworm or cotton bull worm feeding on a corn ear. And so the consumption of kernels results in a yield reduction. And then there's certainly quality issues. So the reduction in plant health, this is tarnished plant bug feeding on potato. The potato plant has uh, all this chlorotic tissue. And so its ability to translocate uh, uh, through the xylem and phloem are reduced through this localized necrosis. Um, and then grain quality issues. Mycotoxins are a major issue. This is a fungi, or a fungi uh, that produces a, a, a toxic substance. A lot of this is associated with insect feeding. And then certainly the aesthetic pieces. So wireworms that damage sweet potatoes, you know, uh, stink bugs that damage a peach. Many of these things are unacceptable to consumers. And so all of these issues motivate why growers choose to manage uh, crop pests. And I think it's important to really point out that, you know, pest issues span the gamut of spatial scales and also production systems, be it organic, uh, or reduced risk or conventional production. And, and I think this is important to remember. So, you know, here's my small community garden. Uh, I had terrible harlequin bug problems, you know, left unmanaged. Um, so I, the pest issues in your community garden can be terrible. If you've ever grown a tomato in your backyard, you might have significant aphid or mite pressure. That translates also to small CSAs. So my good friends in Pittsburgh grow strawberries and tomatoes for the Pittsburgh farmers market. They have chronic issues with pests um, and their local entomologist, which is me, is on speed dial. That translates also to commercial production. And so at the scale of cotton production in the state, um, many of these growers also have significant pest issues. Um, you can see the same sorts of issues in the Yuma Valley. This is where all your romaine lettuce comes from, uh, primarily in December through January. And you can see that the intensity and the scale of production uh, is very different. However, a lot of these same principles of pest management apply. The other issue is thinking about the configuration of landscapes. And so as we, we zoom out into this presentation, we asked the question of how do uh, agricultural production systems vary, at least in the eastern US. And you can see that the composition or, or at least the configuration of the landscapes vary markedly. Um, so you can see differences from uh, uh, Missouri through Wisconsin, that's where my family farm is, uh, to central Ohio, uh, eastern North Carolina, we see a, a varying array in the way sh fields are shaped and the amount of natural habitat that surrounds those fields. When we think about the crops that are grown on these fields, that's the other important piece because we know that these insects have feeding niches where they will 
uh, preferentially feed, like corn earworm prefers to feed on corn, uh, also on soybeans and cotton. And so understanding the balance of these different crops in the landscape is really important to think about how prevalent we can expect these insects to be and what the impacts could be as far as growers needing to manage these pests. So I think the other key part of this is just the intensification of agricultural systems. And so since the mid thirties, we've really changed the way that we manage crops given that we've mechanized agriculture at a large spatial scale. And so here's some aerial photography from central Wisconsin. It's one of our primary vegetable production areas in the state. Uh, and what you see is that in the early thirties or the mid thirties, uh, field sizes are fairly small. Um, as we look at that same set of landscapes marching through time, we see that field sizes tend to grow larger. And so I was curious about this and ortho rectified these images and then went in and digitized fields. And what you find is when you look at hedgerows and field separation, you see that field sizes since the 30s have increased markedly uh, from about five hectares to over 10 hectares in some cases or 25, but the max is, is really important. Thinking about 60, 50 hectare fields is, is, is quite sizable. A lot of this transition has been enabled by the advent of inexpensive electrical pumps to pump groundwater in this particular system. And so agricultural technology has enabled the expansion of production systems into these high value vegetable crops. The point here is that the overhead for maintaining these really high investment uh, infrastructures to pump water onto these crops means that the growers tolerance for losses and their ability to grow crops that are of minor value uh, continues to erode. So they're more beholden to growing, in this case, potatoes in the system. All of that together, coupled with pest management, this is really what we're seeing currently. Uh, this is the amount of uh, imidacloprid, one neonicotinoid seed treatment that's commonly used in corn, soybeans, and a variety of different crops. And what you see is just the aggregation of high intensity use of this one mode of action insecticide across the, um, the corn belt, certainly the Mid-South, uh, which is the Mississippi Delta in the Southeast. Uh, these, these trends are really driven by the use of seed treatments. Um, and as you can see, these same insecticides are used on a variety of crops. And the question is, if we repeatedly use these same insecticides across this broad spatial scale, what are the implications of that transition? Insects have a remarkable capacity to develop resistance, and these are physiological, generally uh, uh, um, detoxification pathways in which they can uh, feed on an, a toxic plant um, or be exposed to a toxic chemical and withstand that, um, that exposure. And that translates into what we consider to be uh, insecticide resistance. Those insects go on to pass on their genetics. And so if we look at the global scale of resistance, these are resistance records back to the 60s. Uh, we see that throughout the tropical areas um, and, and into the temperate areas, there's an awful lot of resistance in both agricultural and medical pests. Medical pests would include things like malaria, mosquitoes, and ticks. And so this is just an interesting representation of, of the extent of resistance uh, that happens due to the overuse of insecticides. North Carolina is not uh, any different from that previous map. Here's our uh, cotton production system. And one thing we'll note with this figure is uh, we've released uh, a BT toxin that's expressed in cotton, particularly targeting cotton bollworm uh, in the mid 90s. Uh, subsequently, there have been releases of several multi or pyramided traits that include multiple toxins targeting this one pest. And this was viewed as a, a very large benefit for producers because it alleviated the necessity to spray. However, if we look retrospectively, the amount of spraying that's going on in North Carolina cotton right now for insect pests has continued to creep upward. And the question is, is despite uniform uh, adoption of this technology, why are we seeing this trend? And this is where we'll start getting into that spatial context of how we address this emerging problem. 
So if we look at that same sort of data we see in the blue line, that's the adoption of BT cotton in the state. So from 1996 to approximately 2016, uh, we hit saturation where uh, almost 99% of cotton grown in the state of North Carolina is expressing one or more of these BT toxins uh, shown on the top. And what we've seen since all this exposure has happened repeatedly over time is the development of resistance. So if we looked at the number of cotton bollworm sprays, which is the red line, we see a reduction due to suppression of populations. And then in 2015, 16, 17, an increase in the number of sprays. And this is really uh, sort of sounding the warning bells about resistance happening because growers are spraying more for this pest after scouting. So where the toxins are no longer working effectively in the uh, genetically engineered cotton. I thought this was probably driven by the cross uh, uh, use of these same toxins in corn. And so corn, genetically engineered corn and genetically engineered cotton share the same sorts of toxin families. And so places where these crops are grown in, uh, sympatrically are, are at greater risk for resistance, knowing that this insect feeds on both GMO crops. And so that's really part of what the next piece of this story is, is how did we get here as far as resistance? And, and is this cross-crop licensing of the same technologies really driving this at a spatial scale? And so the question is, what landscapes are really risky for BT resistance evolution? And can we use landscape data to better understand that relationship? And so I really wanted to ask, you know, what's the uh, how does the abundance or the ratio of these different crops in the landscape relate to the probability of injury in, in BT cotton? So I must say that this isn't necessarily a new issue. So folks in my department way back into the 70s were thinking about landscapes and thinking about cotton bollworm and how this insect cycles through multiple crops in the system. And so I think this is a really good example. Folks in the 70s using terms like agroecosystem Oftentimes we feel like we're reinventing the wheel. Uh, this is a really good case for me. I thought that this was remarkable work that really set the foundation for how we should think about these insects in landscapes. And so uh, this sort of work sets the framework for now we've introduced BT into this system or GMO uh, crops. How does this sort of sequential ecology really play out in real time as far as resistance? Using that old work, we can look at historical bollworm data as far as activity in the landscape. And we do know a lot about their ecology. They start off uh, pupating in the soil from the prior season. Those adults emerge, they oviposit or lay eggs on weeds. Those insects develop on the weeds in the non-crop areas. Uh, then they uh, pupate in the soil, emerge, and they colonize corn. So that's the first opportunity for BT resistance selection. Uh, the corn insects then pupate and then spill over into two susceptible crops, cotton, soybeans, and also to some extent peanuts. And so that second opportunity to ex be exposed to cotton that's expressing BT toxins was really the interesting part. You know, does spillover result in widespread injury due to a high selective filter that only favored resistant individuals? So we looked at a, a bunch of historical injury data collected by an extension faculty in our department who had went out and did uh, conducted field surveys. And what we see is that same suppression trend. So as BT was adopted, the probability of injury on the field level declined significantly due to the high level of efficacy. However, as we saw with the spray data, we saw increasing levels of uh, injury, which is an indication uh, that since the early 2000s, we've been experiencing greater than expected injury in BT cotton. And so from this historical data set, it really informed and set the stage for sort of our geospatial approach to this question. So we use this sort of pipeline, which is fairly straightforward. We looked at pest activity and injury in the field. We connected that with some weather data. We looked at pest phenology. And then we asked the question of how does the surrounding landscape really translate into greater injury? And the goal is to develop models and grower tools that growers can adapt to be able to understand where resistance is likely to occur. 
So in 2018 and 2019, we had a, a NIFA funded project that looked at the probability of injury in cotton fields, commercial cotton fields throughout North and South Carolina. We looked at about 340 fields in which uh, folks went out and actually collected cotton bulls uh, from random plants. We score the bulls for injury. Uh, and then we connected that injury to the amount of cotton and corn in the landscape. And so the outcome of that study was not really a surprise. The amount of BT crops or GM cotton and corn that are grown in the landscape uh, was positively associated with the amount of damage. And this might look like a hodgepodge, but when we zoom in, we see that there's really strong aggregations of the amount of corn and cotton that are grown. And we do know that you know, those crops are grown and expressed uniformly. About 95% of the crops of each of those are expressing these toxins. And so this gives growers an idea of just where they should be concerned, right? Uh, it might not be a solution to pest evolution to these problems or to these toxins, but it does give growers an understanding of where they need to be more proactive. Depending on where they are in this space, they could have greater or less expectation for recurring resistance issues. So that was really part of the story. This was um, the first step. The next step was to try to come up with a better understanding of, you know, where we can do a better job for enabling resistant individuals or susceptible individuals in this case to make it through uh, the system and reproduce and reduce that resistance problem. So here we're trying to understand the source sink dynamics of this pest uh, using historical black light data. And what we're trying to save off is this bullworm injury. So you can see that square on the upper left hand corner that will abscise. Um, after insect feeding and that bowl with that caterpillar on it will also drop off the plant resulting in yield losses. And so we wanted to ask the question of, is there some sort of signal in the landscape beyond just BT crops that's meaningful? So working with another CGA faculty, Dr. Brian Rich in statistics, um, and also Seth Dorman, a postdoc in my program, uh, we put together approximately a decade of blacklight data that was collected by the North Carolina Extension Service. And those folks had uh, diligently looked at the amount of cotton bollworm in, in the crop or in the black lights over time. And we thought this is an amazing opportunity to learn more about the variation within seasons of this pest. And we aligned that data with DayMet, uh, so weather data, so these insects are temperature dependent. We looked at crop production data in the surrounding landscape, and then we really leaned on Brian's expertise in, in Bayesian statistics to come up with a, a model really describing what the relationships between this pest and specific host crops were in the landscape. So with all observational data sets, the data sets are oftentimes messy. We knew that there was variable effort in the black light trapping across time. Um, some uh, uh, participants or collaborators in the trap network would turn on their trap for maybe three weeks and some would operate their trap for 10. And so we had to kind of prioritize the heart of the data around when we expected those insects to disperse from weeds into corn, that's our early model, and then from corn into cotton. And ask the question of whether or not the abundance of corn really favored these signals knowing it's a major host. So the results of that analysis were uh, a surprise. We didn't find that corn was uh, a major factor. However, we did find that your place in the state really mattered. So if you're in the southern counties, bullworm were much more active at higher numbers. Uh, we also found that soybean was a major factor as far as uh, uh, a host crop. So the amount of soybean near to the trap uh, resulted in much higher bullworm activity. And you might ask why that's really important. Well, we do know that bullworm also infests soybeans, which represents the one non-BT host crop that's grown at a wide extent in the state. And so that really favors the propagation of susceptible individuals and reduces the probability of resistance alleles being passed on sequentially in some of these high selection environments. And so just to depict that really, um, this is the process and this is the outcome. And so we looked at bullworm activity, we looked at landscapes, and we translated that to the predicted abundance of bullworm with the amount, considering the amount of soybean in the environment. And what we see is pockets where we would expect uh, high levels of bullworm. 
And we compared those to places in which we saw a low ratio of soybeans to Bt crops. And so what this does is helps us identify growers that happen to be in those red places um, that are at greater than expected risk for Bt resistance because that refuge of soybean is not present. And so this gives us another piece to the puzzle to be able to incentivize growers to make decisions about insecticide resistance management, or at least BT crop resistance management, and be more proactive about scouting in those places where we expect the insects to be more resistant. So the third part of this story is really probably the most interesting for me. Um, we're thinking about how we can proactively monitor these pests and give growers new tools. This is really where the visualization of spatial data could be greatly expanded. This project's in its infancy, and we asked the question if, you know, would more timely bollworm flight data in that season uh, help growers actually make a better decision about managing this critical pest? And so the state of the art right now is this bollworm trap data uh, maintained on the NC State Extension website, which is a fantastic resource. Growers can go in and find the nearest trap to their um, uh, to their location and and track the number of bollworms over time. However, what you can see from that figure is the amount of trapping effort really varies. So the trap in Lenore County has almost daily observations. Uh, some of these other traps might only have two or three. Um, and a lot of that's driven by the effort it takes to get out and sample. And so um, what we really wanted to do is think creatively about a way that we could reduce the amount of effort that took to sample and therefore expand the amount of geography that we could cover uh, with this trap network. The other piece is that growers really struggle with annual stochasticity in these populations. So they want to know in the beginning of the season, is this a bad bullworm year or not? And we do know that populations tend to move around over time due to a variety of factors. Um, and so uh, being able to better predict based on early season activity would be an immense advantage for these producers. And I think the only way to do that is to you know, greatly expand the resolution of activity in space and time. So to do that, um, we've developed a bollworm pheromone trap. So these pheromone traps are basically wire, um, wire traps for these insects. Uh, they have a, a small uh, sex pheromone targeting the male at the bottom of the trap. The males fly up into the trap and then through that cone apparatus and, and basically get trapped. And the conventional way to look at this is to go out every day or every week and count the number of bullworm moths that you have. And that's your response variable, or at least what you would report to the growers. These traps have been used for about 60 years and they're widely used throughout the US uh, to monitor various moth pests. And so what we did is basically uh, thought there was a, an opportunity to put an IR sensor on top of that trap neck and then mount some weather data on top of it and so through collaboration with Dr. Alper Boskurt in ECE and, and Dr. Nelson, Natalie Nelson in BAE, we've established this sort of project in which we're trying to use IR sensors, weather data, and upload that information into the cloud and basically get a better idea of real-time activity of this pest. And so this project was started in 2020 and we had some really nice success. Um, we applied this information uh, or this, this trap across 20 different locations in five different counties. So this is the Northeastern corridor along I-95. Uh, this is our major cotton and soybean production area on the Eastern coastal plain of North Carolina. And what we see from this 20 trap array is that the variation in bullworm activity is high across this entire landscape. And so in week four, our peak our peak population uh, movement, we see an immense amount of variation of this pest across a very fine spatial scale. So what's this mean from the growers perspective is that um, growers are not able to be able to make decisions about managing pests based on maybe one or two field samples. They're really gonna have to be focused in on looking almost at every field given the variation that we're seeing in these pests. And so, 
we're thinking about how we can use this information and enable more growers to be in or participate in the project. And so we're extending the network by 20 traps in 2021 uh, through a new trap design. We're going to look at the same 20 locations to ask the question of how the landscape shuffle or crop rotation influences these pests. Will we expect these insects uh, to be at high levels in the same locations, or is it a function of the rotation of crops, much like we saw with the black light data? Moreover, I think it'll be important to expand the network from the mountains to the sea uh, and ask the question of how variable are these pests across broader geographies? Do we need to have as intensive of a sampling network as we used in, in 2020? So I think this really fits in with the transition to uh, more technologically advanced agriculture. So this real-time network, the growers have been asking, how can we be more efficient at understanding activity of pests? And so one of our really fantastic stakeholders out in Nash County, uh, Mr. Jonathan Evans sent me this uh, screenshot of his uh, climate climate field view, which is a platform that he uses for all sorts of things. But he asked the question of why can't I have uh, data about pest activity on the Baines light trap. And so we've hosted our uh, automated traps on his farm in a few different locations now. And he's looking forward to the opportunity to be able to visualize uh, patterns of these pests uh, in space and time. And I think that this really fits in with that sort of technological transition that these growers have made across multiple different uh, pieces of equipment. But now they're asking the question of how can we make pest data more accessible now that they've really optimized some of their agronomic inputs through technological advances, many of which include spatial techniques. So just to wrap up a little bit, um, certainly no novel management solutions are required to continue improving the sustainability of agriculture and also the resiliency of the production systems that we have. And I think it's important to remember that research needs to go across a continuum from organisms all the way to regions. And so although re every research solution might not fit a spatial context, there are many that could be really explored in this system and improved. Uh, and spatial data sources really provide additional insight into how we might be able to improve grower outcomes. And certainly the transdisciplinary nature will continue to grow. And so engaging folks at the CGA and a variety of different um, um, scientists and other fields will be really important to enable more incremental advancements in pest management in the future. And so with that, I'd like to just conclude and thank uh, my program, certainly thank the CGA for inviting me, thank all the producers that let us uh, um, uh, sample things on their farms. And with that, I'd be pleased to stop and take any questions you might have or conversation you want to have. So I'll stop sharing and feel free to write questions in the chat box or go ahead and unmute yourself. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Great. Um, hi, Anders. That was a great talk. Um, so I'm curious, and I'm guessing maybe this is the focus of some of your other work, um, but I'm curious if you've looked at additional pesticides um, besides imidacloprid to determine if this is a species-specific response to this pesticide or if this is a pesticide-specific thing. Like, I'm curious if, if you found in any other work with other insects um, whether or not, like, competition is a factor um, or if this is just, just a trend that you're seeing with the bullworm and this specific pesticide. Yeah, so, sorry, I use imidacloprid, which is a neonicotinoid, as an example of widespread use. Oh, gotcha, um, so okay. The, so just to clarify, the, the toxin that's expressed in, in the corn and cotton is derived from Bacillus thuringiensis, which is, uh, um, uh, expresses a crystalline protein that uh, basically pokes a hole in the insect gut. And so then the insect basically leaks hemolymph into their, from their gut into their um, body cavity and they die, right? So it's, it's maybe one of the things that 
has been most successful in crop protection in a long period of time as far as reducing the amount of sprays. However, these insects have adapted to not open that pore and they have become resistant to that toxin um, in corn and cotton. And so it was a little bit of a different, different system. Sorry about that. But certainly there are multiple tactics, one of which is you know, crop rotation, rotating other crops that can help alleviate the resistance process. Um, jump again, just off of what you just said, I was curious if, um, if rotating soybean was one of the recommendations that would be made for those red areas on that map or, or what growers could do to respond to this kind of information. Yeah, so crop diversification probably is one of the things that would be really advantageous. That's a place of the state where they are very intensive cotton growers. Um, and there's some peanuts closer to the Virginia border, but um, more crops that are refuges like soybeans would probably be advantageous in that part of the, the, uh, that part of the state in general. Um, certainly um, more proactive scouting and, and reducing some of the continual use of the same BT toxins would be advantageous. However, there are different levels that are working. So the agricultural industry only will sell the highest elite varieties of corn and cotton with all of those toxins. So they sort of from the top down regulate what the growers have access to. As a result, several growers have transitioned to non-BT corn because they see no benefit of it anymore, which is interesting. So we'll see how that plays out in the future. If you don't mind, I'll just follow on to that real quick. Is you said refuges for these pests? Could that be? Um, I guess depending on the the host range for the pest, but that could be non-crop species too. So has there been any exploration of how, um, I guess, non-managed land in the area could also contribute? Yeah, so that's a part of the state where there's a lot of interest in pulp cutovers uh, for the pellet plant and for the various paper plants up, up there on the Virginia border. So a lot of the non-crop area is, is conifers. Um, I think the, the goal with manipulating refuge is, is really to, you know, generate lots and lots of moths. And so probably the best way to think about that is to restructure the agricultural landscape by including more productive non-BT crops in amongst the BT crops, because you can generate a lot of moths. Um, and so growers can manipulate that um, dynamic by, you know, planting different things if the markets permit. And so I think that's that's probably the most productive way for us to increase the amount of refuge is to incentivize growers to make decisions about planting something other than BT corn or cotton. But, you know, it really depends on how their business works and all those other factors. Uh, I also have a question does what so was a did you use was one of the features you used to see like to see when like a bt when the bt insect would jump from crop to crop was it like did you use like the amount of the amount of waste that they produced so uh, a lot of that work goes back to really basic ecology <clears throat> where they basically set up landscapes, artificial landscapes and labeled these insects um, with rubidium or uh, different, different marking compounds. And they looked at dispersal sequences. So we're using that old data as our context for the ecological system. And we're buying that the abundance of these crops or dynamics of these crops result in sourcing dynamics that have been previously shown. So although we didn't necessarily track dispersal, 
we're we're making the assumption based on prior literature. If that's okay. clear. Yeah. So thinking about some of the uh, automated traps that you're building out, are you looking at where within fields you're placing them as well as like their neighbors versus like what their neighbors are growing, et cetera. So like if you were to plan out across like a whole county and be able to get coverage across like every field there, what would, what do you see as being kind of the best strategy across that spectrum? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the challenge is like getting growers to tell you what's going on because they might not know exactly where they're going to plant certain crops quite yet. Um, so right now we're kind of have a shotgun approach. We're going to find collaborators or we have collaborators identified that will put out a trap and then post hoc will look at what the landscape looked at or look like. Um, this year in that, in that sort of five county focal area, we're going to plan to keep the traps in the same place to get at your question. It's like, how does the shuffle of crop rotation in the landscape result in different variation in these pests at that fine spatial scale? And then we might be able to start asking the question that you had, which is, you know, like, where should we be placing these to get the maximum amount of information? Um, but we're not quite there yet. I think that's all like that whole landscape change piece is going to be really interesting in the future. Yeah, especially since these are pests that move from one system to another consistently. So you'd be able to maybe like traps on the edges might work well in some cases, but in other systems it might not. I'm not not 100% sure having that worked in these systems. Yeah, their dispersal capacity is, is fairly good. So they'll fly, like as adults, they'll live for three to five days, depending on temperature, be very reproductively driven, and they'll disperse up to three or four kilometers. And so that that part of that life stage is is fairly close to like the local migrants, but there's also long distance dispersers that will come in from the Gulf states. And so that's the other part of this whole system is that these insects move around at larger spatial scales as well, which is really interesting. Um, so we're planning on putting traps, like get one of those traps in South Carolina and Georgia to see if we can predict when the migrants are coming this way. Any other questions? Anyone? Uh, I was going to say uh, one more question would be how do you envision an automated trap like the ones you're developing being deployed for a species that doesn't have a very good like pheromone lure? Or is there no real method for that? Yeah, there's not really a good method. I mean, the pheromone is ideal for the inexpensive trap. So our goal was to build traps that were less than $100 because they could be adapted to a variety of different systems. Um, certainly fall armyworm was one we were thinking about, which is a huge issue in Africa right now. Um, how do we build an inexpensive trap that would suit that? And for a lot of these moth pests, there's really pretty effective pheromones because that's the way that they find their mates in the system. And so for these big economic pests like our midgera, so old world bullworm, which is a huge issue as far as quarantine pests, and then fall armyworm and a variety of these other ones. This is readily adaptable. All you do is change the pheromone on the bottom. So it's pretty handy. Um, and that was part of the design. But yeah, if you don't have a if you don't have a pheromone, you're stuck doing 
old fashioned in entomology, which is get out there and count things. All right, well, I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, there's no other questions. Don't want to hold folks any longer. Um, Yeah, well, thank you so much, Anders. Sure, really thanks enjoyed so much. I just had one more question. Um, how receptive are the growers to working with you and your team? Um, and what's the process you go through for selecting new growers to work with? Usually we go through the county agent service. So Extension has an agent in every county that works on crops or livestock or 4-H or something like that. You know, So there's several people in every county that fit the extension rules. So that's our first point of contact. We reach out to the agents in places where we know the crops are grown and, and then they typically have connections with specific growers. Um, there are also influential producers um, that like sit on the soybean board, for instance. And those are people that are generally really progressive producers. And if you call them, um, they'll host research on their farm. They'll let you basically, you know, as long as it's not impacting yield, you can you can usually convince these folks to do quite a bit of on-farm research. Um, so that's really the process. It's a lot of networking, um, cold calling growers, working with county agents, um, and just selecting places that sort of fit the um, the sort of question that we have. And and that's the general approach that we've used um, to some success. It's, it's kind of hard, but it takes a while. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, so Anders, uh, we've been looking at trying to garner kind of um, up-to-date information about um, pest spread based on text uh, forums like Twitter or um, you know other documents that we can search. Uh, how do, I mean, do you have any tips about how grow, growers communicate or is there some kind of subreddit that <laughs> might be good to look at or do you have any recommendations or thoughts on that line? You know, I think like what spatial scale, like you're talking regional, regional pests or global or um, I mean, we're, it's still kind of at a very new stage. We're not sure what we would be able to, to get, but to try to kind of uh, be early indicators, you know, oh, people are starting to talk about this, they're worried about this in this area, or they're citing it in this area. Yeah, I, I wonder how, how much efficacy you can have with Twitter. A lot of that, you know, it's like the extension specialists will talk and retweet everybody else's tweets like from the Mid-South all the way to yep. the Southeast. And I'm sure you've seen some of that and and whether or not that's growers, it's usually folks getting phone calls and they they sort of know the bullworm flight's happening. And so then there's a lot of Twitter action about bullworms and get out there and scout. Um, so that's one, one avenue, certainly. Um, the old school version, what I would trust as well at like the North Carolina scale, what I do when I try to figure out when something's gonna happen is I call the independent crop consultants in which we probably have 40 or so in the state. And some some of those folks will look after four to 5,000 acres of crops and they have very large teams that are out there scouting for service for growers. And so that consulting community throughout the Southeast and in the Midwest are some of the best resources for when things are happening um, as far as pest spread, and they can generally tell you what's going on. Right, but they don't share that information in a public forum in some way. Unfortunately, no, because you know it's fee for service. Like if you call them, they'll tell you, but it, they're they want to you know recoup value for their growers, so mm -hmm. they provide recommendation to the producer. But if they broadcasted it that these insects were in Wilson County next to Goldsboro, then all the halo effect of growers benefiting from one person's investment would be mm -hmm. affected, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's usually more of a person to person, one-on-one -on -one interaction, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Thank you.
Sure. I guess one, one last comment um, is that it's really interesting that in that small spatial area, you had so much variation in bollworm, which makes me really question our ability to like model spread. Um, so do you have any idea? I mean, I guess you talked about some of the, the reasons why, but um, do you have any idea? I guess, can, can you summarize what the the factors are that you think are causing that variation in such a small area? Yeah, probably from the ecology perspective would be better. These are both local and migrant pests. And so um, we have populations that, that overwinter here in North Carolina and they'll overwinter as far north as maybe New Jersey. Um, and so you'll get a lot of propagation of local populations, which makes it more difficult to distinguish the local from the migrant populations of these insects. There are others that would be of much of economic importance and would be much easier to predict as far as spread. And those would be insects that migrate from southerly latitudes north. So velvet bean caterpillar, uh, fall or worm, a variety of these different moth pests really have this very um, um, cyclic movement north. And so they don't overwinter here, so you know when you're seeing them, you could predict spread. And so that would be another sort of objective is to look at pests that, you know, might not have their endemic region be North Carolina, because you're right, I think it's much a lot of local movement for these insects, the bullworm, uh, but others might really fit that spread model sort of idea. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, um, I'm going to wrap up here. I'm going to, as usual, there is a post forum social hosted by the uh, Geospatial Gradu Graduate Student Organization starting at 430. And I just put in the chat the link to, uh, to the social. And once again, uh, thank you, Anders, for uh, speaking today. And also thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris, for hosting. Thanks so much.